So good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is enjoying their day. Start of their day. Anyway, but before we start, I'd just like to introduce to you uh, Clayton Copway, who is a, uh, an associate of Dillon Consulting Limited in New Brunswick. And uh, uh, Clayton is, uh, uh, we commissioned uh, Clayton or Dillon's uh, consultant to uh, participate in our uh, environment management uh, course with Nelma. So uh, with that, uh, just a few little items. Uh, and Clayton will tell you a little bit about himself before he begins. But just to let everybody know that uh, we'd like you to uh, 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 mute your microphones for this session. And uh, we'll, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat. And what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll answer the questions after the session or before the session closes. Uh, always uh, remember to uh, to um, fill out the uh, session feedback on WOVA. Also, his presentation and this recording will also be on that WOVA app as well for the event. So again, welcome to the um, uh, environmental management uh, uh, session. Uh, so Clayton, I'll let you take it away. Miigwech, uh, Leona. Anin Gishka Kasa and Dishna Kaz Curve Lake and Dunshaba Shaggy and Dorum. So as Leona said, my name is Clayton Kapway. I'm originally from Curve Lake, First Nation. I grew up hunting and fishing and really enjoying um, exercising, you know, the traditional practices of my of my ancestors there. And I became really interested in how we make decisions about protecting environment protecting the environment and so I went off and I did a uh, bachelor of science in marine and freshwater biology I was always really drawn to the water um, and after that I worked on a master's so I'm trained more so in the western science but I was fortunate enough to have mentors uh, during my uh, university degree that really promoted and and supported me to think about indigenous ways of decision making, but also about indigenous knowledge systems and, and embracing other forms of knowledge. Um, and so as I progressed through my career, I started to realize that the First Nation communities that I had grown up on were largely excluded from a from the from the discussions about uh, land use planning and even things like environmental management planning, and that you know my grandfathers and my fathers and my grandmothers and grandmothers really had to fight and, and, and fight hard for that recognition throughout the 60s and 70s, and even up into through and, and through the 90s where we saw some of the large case law that was happening. And my grandmother as chief of, of her community at the time, I remember her taking me to British Columbia. Um, that was right after the Sparrow decision. And we are really interested in how West Coast uh, communities, First Nation communities, were really thinking about self-governments and taking uh, control, more control over the management of their own communities and, and leading the way in that way. So uh, just as an aside, that's sort of from the BC links to learning, that's uh, my story about British Columbia. But um, throughout my work with uh, Dylan Consulting, I'm, I'm a community planner there. I assist First Nation clients and other indigenous communities with things like land use planning, environmental planning, and other th other forms of support in that way. So through consultation, um, as well as engagement. And so today we're gonna talk about environmental management, and this is from the lens of the National Aboriginal Lands Managers Association. So they've invested a lot of time and effort in developing really, um, really solid toolkits that provide really good information to lands managers that can help them start thinking about this process and develop de developing strategies to implement some of these. And so today we're going to sp specifically talk about environmental management and environmental management planning. And so today we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about NAMA. I'm just going to give a little plug for NAMA and the training that they offer. This is part of a series of training that they offer. We're going to talk a little bit about in the environment in our communities, as well as the issue, the environmental issues that we're dealing with. And this will be a short discussion. I'm not as good with the Winova 
uh, apps and polling. So I would hope that this will be more of a discussion, short discussion. I'm going to talk specifically about climate change. One, because it's probably one of the biggest impacts that our communities are dealing with today. Um, I'll also provide an overview of environmental legislation that you'll want to be aware of as part of environmental management. And then I'll actually get into some more of the details about what environmental management planning is, what's the framework that NALMA uh, has developed and uses to help guide uh, lands managers in, in thinking about setting these processes up. So NALMA is the National Aboriginal Lands Managers Associations, and it may, it's made up of eight regional lands associations that has about 170 First Nation and Inuit community members at large. And those communities operate under a variety of different land regimes. So some are still operating under the Indian Act. Others are, are under sectoral self-government through the First Nation Lands Management Act or other um, legislation. And they also have communities that are operating under self-government agreements as well. So it is truly a national, um, oper uh, national coverage in terms of the, the communities that we're supporting to help them with their lands management. Mm -hmm. So it's a First Nation lands management. So it is a bit of a focus on First Nation and I'll try and, and be more as inclusive as I can as we go through. But please forgive me if I step back and talk specifically about the First Nation context. Um, and it's uh, about networking. So part of their support of forums like this is to help professional development for Indigenous lands managers to really share those stories and learn from each other. And it's also a way that we incorporate Indigenous values and beliefs in lands management into how we're, we're actually operating this. So it's, it's by Indigenous lands managers for Indigenous lands managers. And keeping in mind those grassroots perspectives that our communities uh, have developed over the years. So for today, so generally the training that we offer uh, it's really just to introduce some of the environmental concepts and uh, issues and facts. We're going to familiarize your, you with some federal laws and acts that relate to the environment. Um, and we're going to provide an overview of the environmental management planning process. We're not really going to have time to get too much into detail. And the training is offered by NALMA and it's, it's uh, administered through funding from Indigenous Services Canada. Um, and it's delivered in a couple different ways. One is through their professional lands manage, management certification program. That's a university uh, partner uh, program, as well as specialized training. So I'm actually familiar with the specialized tra training more so, and we deliver this over a three-day time period usually. It's designed to serve the needs of First Nations uh, predominantly, uh, but is also applicable to other communi Indigenous communities as well. It's designed to be accessible and simple. We try and use simple terminology. And we're really coming from a common principles and best practices approach. Um, and it's important to remember that the toolkit, so NALMA has toolkits for all of these, these trainings, um, it shouldn't form the basis for good solid legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, my wife is a lawyer, and every time I start to talk about the law, she just says, raise your hand if you went to law school. <clears throat> so when we talk about the environment, we're really focused on the water, the land, the air, and everything that lives on there. And when you see the graphic here, really the air, water, and land is really supporting the plants and animals of which we are a part of that. And so when we think about Indigenous relationships with the environment, it was much more holistic and it was a deep, deep relationship that in our ancestors had to understand how the animals were, were moving, how the decisions that they made about harvesting and moving would impact those, uh, you know, our brothers, and our four-legged brothers and sisters. And so as we move into a more modern context, you're seeing new ways to think about the environment. You're thinking about technological advances that have brought, brought change, um, that have Im, uh, improved, in some cases, improved the lives uh, of our communities. 
but it's also had unintended consequences. So, the, so for example, the reliance on fossil fuels is really impacting us in terms of climate change. We're actually seeing that the decisions and the activities that we, we do on Mother Earth is really having that effect. And so when you think about the perspective, predominantly from a Western perspective, that the Earth is too big, we can't have an impact. Our ancestors knew intimately that that the decisions we made about resource use and, and impacting the environment had direct effects on our survival. And so what I think you're seeing is people coming back to that realization that we are part of a very finite and very delicate um, ecosystem that we need to think more critically about those decisions and this, those principles about uh, seven generations teachings, thinking about future generations are really important right now. And those are indigenous derived concepts. And so in a modern context, we really need to think about how do we manage our activities. So here, when we think most of the things that we talk about today about impacts to the environment are really driven by uh, human activities. And so those are things like, as I've said, reliance on fossil fuels, but it's also things like consumerism and technology. We've become a throwaway generation. And so how often do you actually fix a refrigerator as opposed to just replace it these days? It's, it's become far cheaper to simply replace than to repair, repair the technology that we have. And so we the, those result in issues around climate change from the fossil fuels, but solid waste. Our communities are always generating waste. Um, you have, this leads to things like species decline in certain areas. So as urban sprawl fragments habitats, you're starting to see species, their abundance and their distribution declining considerably. And you're also getting a degradation of habitat. And we're also starting to see that human health is being affected. So the actual impacts that we're having is actually affecting our health particularly. So here, when we think, think about environmental issues, what do you think, and this is a, an open discussion, we can use the chat or you can raise your hand, uh, but what are some of the most common environmental issues for Indigenous communities? And it can be based on your experience or things that you've heard about as well. Anyone want to raise their hand? Hello. Hello. Would you mind just introducing yourself? I'm Cindy Collins, Mott's First Nation. Uh, we've had some problems with uh, um, Cedar Mill at some point and another. Uh, they uh, use portion of the land to pile up some of the hog fuel and um, that's not very good for the environment. So it costs just about a million dollars for that removal and for some structural fill to be um, put in that place. So that's uh, one environment issue. So more related to like a contaminated site, for example, right? Like the, the fact that you had industry in that area and now we have legacy issues associated with the contaminants that are now in the soil that have to be cleaned up afterwards. Would that be? Yes, that? and uh, cleaning it up, it costs just about a million dollars and also to replace it with structural fill. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Uh, Clayton, oh, yeah. oh. in the chat, in the chat, we have contaminated drinking water as an issue, uh, proper waste management in the past years, hidden dump sites is another one from Carol. Yep. Uh, Lisa had the contaminated sites drinking water. Contaminated drinking water. Yep, and that's a big one. Contaminated drinking water is a particularly important issue for Indigenous communities. 
Proper waste management in the past year due to fires. We now have issues with flooding. Yep, deforestation. All really, all really important issues. So emergency situations because of fire, and then the flooding, flooding issue, and animals leaving the territory. Exactly. Backyard mechanics. Yep. Tur tourists uh, in. The Natani lakes are usually the ones who leave a lot of garbage on the beaches and also old boats in the yards. And then an unbalance of predator and prey, yep. So these are all really, really good examples. Yep, interference with wildlife migration. That's great. Those are all really important issues that we have to deal with in terms of Indigenous communities. And there's lots, there's lots of others as well. But generally, when we think about how communities are running, they're really focused on a, a, few, a few ones that are always sort of omnipresent. So these can be things like solid waste management, which we talked about, um, sewage, so wastewater treatment, for our communities in some cases, right? As communities grow, we have to provide opportunities because we're always making waste. Fuel storage is another one for communities that we may not often think about, but when you think about most, uh, lots of houses that were built um, in the like early 50s um, or even later on, will have some type of oil tank in some cases, which over time can leak and cause challenges in and around sites. So it can make every house in a community, in some cases, if there's oil tanks in there that have leaked, can become a contaminated site and that oil can get into the, into the water table. You also have um, environmental emergencies. So things like a forest fire, for example, or flooding, um, or it could be a forest fire clearing an area it's burning so hot, it clears an area, and then you get ero uh, erosion issues and flooding. Um, and you also have the impacts of climate change. And, and these, we're gonna spend a little bit of time now talking a little bit more about climate change as a specific example, but recognizing that our communities as we grow and we're thinking about sustainability, we have to plan for how we're going to deal with these, with these waste systems, uh, our waste streams as well, um, and how we're going to provide clean drinking water for our communities. So we're gonna switch gears here. We'll talk a little bit about climate change impacts. So at the global level, generally um, climate change impacts are really associated which, with the warming of the climate. So basically, the release of greenhouse gases has created uh, an environment that holds a lot of the heat, the radiant energy that we get from the sun, and consequently that atmosphere holds heat, it becomes a really good insulator. Um, and so what ends up happening is you get a general warming of the surface uh, of, the, of the earth. Um, the oceans, you can think of them as giant heat pumps basically, they basically soak up the majority of the solar radiation and hold on to it for a period of time and then release it back. Um, and so if that heat can't escape outside of our atmosphere, it gets charged up. Um, and we see declines in snow and ice cover. We see the melting of glaciers and ice sheets that results in rising sea levels. Um, and we also see the fact that the atmosphere is warmer cre means that you're basically going to have a lot of pent up energy um, that needs to be um, that needs to be uh, balanced. And what you have is extreme precipitation or extreme drought. So you're seeing more extreme weather in certain cases. In client in Canada, in particular the impacts of climate change, we're really thinking about uh, in terms of Canada's warming at, at double the rate of global averages. So this will generally mean warmer summers and warmer winters. Um, it'll mean an annual increase in precipitation in particular, changes in snowfall amounts, changes in stream flow, winter flows will be higher, spring peaks early, er, will be earlier and overall. And so I currently live in New Brunswick, St. John, New Brunswick on the Wallistook 
which is uh, the major river in, in New Brunswick. It's uh, also called the St. John River. And for two years, you know, three years ago, or sorry, two years ago, um, they had two years of record uh, flooding associated with that. They hadn't seen that before, but the river basically rose 28 feet. Um, you'll see a reduction in summer flows. And so what this does is it creates rivers that become a little bit warmer. And so they don't favor those cold blooded fish species that like the cold water. So things like salmon in particular and trout really thrive in colder water. If your summer flows are so low that they're getting heat stress, then it'll impact them. You have increased flood and drought, more extreme storms, uh, a lengthening of the forest fire season. And for our northern um, neighbor, nor northern communities, a loss of sea ice. And overall, for our coastal communities, we're seeing an increase in sea levels. And so while there's impacts, some communities will also see some changes in the way, some beneficial changes. And so really about environmental management, it's about trying to look at it from both sides. What are the impacts that we need to plan for, but what are also the opportunities that we might not have, uh, that we might not have had because of this change? So for example, you could think of a longer growing season for particular crops and things like that, or growing of crops in areas that had, uh, had uh, sustained that type of agricultural before. And so the strategies to address the climate change, we see that we see a lot of communities building community resilience through vulnerability assessments. So actually going through the process of saying, you know, how are our communities vulnerable to climate change? And then also putting together adaptation plans. So how do we actually mitigate, avoid, or in some case adapt to whatever the climate impacts that our vulnerability assessment has told us? we need to prepare for. And so those could be things like uh, sea level rise. In some cases, it's moving infrastructure away from shorelines to higher ground. It can be things like tree planting um, and reforesting those areas that we're concerned about flooding, for example. Communities are also looking at trying to become more energy self-reliant and reduce their fossil fuel emissions. When we think about remote communities or communities that are reliant on diesel generation, you know, the opportunities for solar and wind energy are, are increasing you know, every year. We're also seeing a, a more emphasis on reforestation of those areas. Also a better understanding of how fire is a really important uh, component of the ecosystem and how to use it properly. And then we're also seeing individual changes. So promoting a better diet, better transportation and, and use of energy. So for environmental legislation, um, we really promote that a land manager, you don't have to be an expert, but you should start to build your understanding of how all of this federal legislation is applicable within, in particular reserve communities, so banned lands. Um, but you also have to be aware of some of the other legislation that may govern activities as communities start to invest and develop uh, outside of their reserve lands. Um, and so we're seeing that for some communities as well, is that they have to have a really solid understanding of where, what the environmental regulations are so that they can support their community's growth. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for looking at environmental legislation is, is associated with liabilities and due diligence. Um, so looking at how, you know, the decisions that a, a community, a First Nation community or other Indigenous community makes has consequences in some ways. And you, if you don't know about those, you could be held liable for the results of, for example, um, you know, damming a river when you shouldn't have or something along those lines where you're really putting your, your community's reputation as well as, as well as their finances at risk because it opens the door for liability. So it's really important to do your due diligence. And so this is just a snapshot of the environmental legislation. You have SEPA, which is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act of 1999. And this is the pr primary 
focus is on the environment and human health. So it focuses on um, focuses on toxic uh, regulating toxic substances and those that could be harmful considered harmful. You also have the new Impact Assessment Act, um, which replaced the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act of 2012. And again, this focuses on trying to understand the impacts from uh, projects and development. And generally, they're larger projects that we're thinking of in terms of this. Um, uh, and so that's in force now. And we're now working through those uh, processes to see how the policies and regulations actually work. For fisheries in particular, you have the Fisheries Act, and there's a focus on the protection and management of fish and fish habitat, as well as fisheries. And this also can include uh, First Nations fisheries in some jurisdictions as well. We also have the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, um, and this is primarily focused on the protection of species uh, from the risks of extinction. You have the Canadian Navigable Waters Act of 2019, which replaced the Navico, uh, Navigation Protection Act of 2012. And this is all focused on protecting waters for public travel. Interestingly, um, when we think about Canada in particular, the first highways in, in North America were the river systems, um, which is largely where this legislation comes from, is protecting the right of access to those highways. Um, and we also have the Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act of 2013. And this was really developed uh, as a way to start thinking about enforceable regulations to help ensure that First Nations uh, have access to safe drinking water. Uh, before that, there was no federal legislation that even talked about um, regulating safe drinking water on communities. And so these are some of the most important federal legislation that you should be aware of uh, from an Indigenous community's perspective. Um, and there are other, there's quite a bit of federal legislation and some of it has overlapping jurisdiction as well as the provinces. And I'll talk about that here shortly. So there's also provincial and municipality, uh, municipal legislation. Um, and generally, these arise from the div division between uh, jurisdictions, so between federal and provincial jurisdiction. Um, and so there's quite a bit of overlap in legislation. So, for example, in Ontario, uh, there's, a, there's an Ontario species at risk uh, legislation. And so SARA doesn't necessarily apply outside of, of the federal jurisdiction. But here in New Brunswick, New Brunswick does not have its own species at risk legislation and so SARA applies across the province. Um, one of the most interesting thing and one of the for me as, a, as an Indigenous person is to see um, Indigenous laws particularly First Nation environmental laws are now starting to come about. Um, First Nations have started to think about their own laws that are based on their own culture, their own uh, heritage and so this is a, an emerging uh, place as well, where communities are now starting to develop their own, their own regulations and laws based on, um, you know, their indigenous perspectives and culture. Provincial and municipal legislation is largely in a, in, inapplicable on banned or reserve lands, but when you think about a community's traditional territory, in, in most cases. Um, if, if they're not considered reserve lands or they're not legislated in that way, then generally the provincial and municipal regulations will also apply to those areas. So you do have to start building your knowledge in terms of understanding those provincial and municipal regulations as well. And so this, just, this graphic just shows you on reserve lands, the balance and off reserve lands and off reserve, there really is a couple different layers of legislation that are all designed to protect the environment. But in First Nation uh, communities, there isn't those layers. You have, you know, generally, unless you have First Nation laws, federal jurisdiction is there. And those laws are very coarse. They're not designed to support a, an individual community's uh, sustainability. They're really focused on how do we provide a national so a one, one size fits all 
for all of Canada. It's not really focused on an individual community or band. And so the best practice for legislation is to build your knowledge base. I love this little graphic and, and knowledge is really when you take information and you start to develop concepts and put them together. One of the keys is to invest in good legal advice. So that's a really key part of the environmental management uh, planning process that NELMA has prepared is that you do need to have a legal voice to help guide you through that as well. And that's how you start to build your own awareness and knowledge um, and seek out training opportunities wherever you can. Okay. So now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk specifically about environmental management planning or EMP. So you're gonna see me kind of refer to both of those as we go through. So what is it? One, it's the process by which we manage and protect our lands and the environment. We, it, it's supposed to pro promote best practices, um, create space for innovation, and ultimately focus on sustainability. It's about changing people's behaviors and thinking about the impacts that they have in their communities about their development. So those backyard mechanics, it's about leveling the playing field to say, you know, we understand that you have an economic driver there, that you are trying to leverage you know, your home residence to, you know, exploit the skills that you have, but there is a place and there are environmental controls that need to hap have to happen in order to make that a sustainable piece of our community. We're not saying that you can't do that. We just saying you can't necessarily do it in a residential area or someplace where you're going to contaminate your well and the wells of your neighbors. Um, and it should always be grounded in our community, culture, and traditions. And that's really the opportunity. Um, yes, Indigenous communities have been excluded from these management uh, discussions and conversations, but it's also created an opportunity for Indigenous communities to take the best of what Western knowledge has said, this is how we need to plan and indigenize it in the way that is most useful for their communities. And it's really an opportunity to create some innovation in the thinking and to promote Indigenous thinking about how do we have sustainable communities. It's important uh, because we need to think about those seven generations. You know, largely our communities are tied to a few community sites and those sites are small. And so we need to make sure that we are leaving the land, air, and water in the best possible place for those future generations. And that's hard because in some cases we're just a small voice, but we have to do our part. We have to make sure our house is in order before we can start telling others how to manage their own. What's required, we have to make them easily, we have to make our plans easily understood. They have to be transparent and they have to be repeatable. So they have to be consistent so that no one feels as though they're getting preferential treatment, um, but they also have to understand that there are certain rules that we've grounded in the community perspectives um, about what it is that uh, our community um, values and protects in terms of the environment. It's really required all the time. It's not something that you can just say, yes, we're going to have an environmental management and you leave it be. It requires that chief and councils, and I know lands managers face this as well. Lands is always the last person at the table most times when decisions are made at the council table and we need decision makers to start using these tools uh, appropriately and recognizing that they have to basically have the land use plan and the environmental management plan on their desk so that when community members come to them and say, we need, we want to build a house or put up a shop, they can open and say, what do our land use plan say? What does our environmental management planning say about those? What are the things that we need to make an informed decision? And so this gets to the responsibility. One of the keys is it's not just the lands manager's responsibility, it's everyone within the First Nations administration. They have to understand this. If they don't uh, know, they have to have somebody who they can contact in order to make sure that those policies are put in place. 
there has to be leadership um, from the chief and council. So if chief and council are investing time, effort, and energy in this, then they have to understand that they need to use it, that it needs to be something that has to be used. It can't just be put up on a shelf and say, what a great plan we have on the wall. They actually have to make it work. Um, and in some cases, it's you have to figure out who's going to be the leader at the departmental level. Lands managers are very busy. We understand that. And a lot of times they're also told they're also the environment uh, manager as well. And so in some cases, this takes an investment in terms of uh, resourcing from a community administration level. Um, and you have to think in terms of, do we need an environmental department? Do we need an officer? Do we need a manager? And do we need a committee to help us make decisions about our path forward? So the land management uh, planning framework that we use is based on an environmental management system. And this is something that businesses generally use it's an ISO, so an international standard system that incorporates a, uh, a database and procedures. And it's really about training personnel and monitoring and summarizing information about a particular environmental aspect that they want to report on. Um, so for example, it could be things like paper use. It could be uh, about air travel, how much air travel a company is using. And so it's really a focus on how do we train our people within our organization to understand the environmental compliance that we're, we want to achieve or the environmental management we want to achieve. And so this is pretty costly. Um, it also takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do this. And so for a, for a First Nation, we really focus on planning and using this system as a, as a framework for how we can structure our thinking about environmental management. And so we promote a staged approach that works to try and create awareness and ground the environmental management principles in the community, lay the foundation for those future environmental pro programs. So it can be really become a roadmap for what are the things that we need to tackle? What, you know, step one is, you know, get some funding to have a dedicated person to run this down. Step two, so on and so forth. And it becomes a real roadmap for how you're going to tackle your environmental issues and it's important to remember that you know when federal or provincial governments think about funding they don't fund projects they fund plans and so this can be really an opportunity to lay out these are all the things we have to deal with what you know where can we find find resources to get these done and it becomes an opportunity for you to take your plan and say look we we invested in this plan now help me figure this stuff out, help me get some answers to these things. It'll encourage a review of current practices and also what are the things, behavioral things you need to improve, um, what are the goals we want to achieve, uh, to achieve, and it's going to help you once you go through the AMP process to say, and you start making the plan work, what did we actually achieve what we thought we were going to achieve? It helps you get a benchmark to manage and celebrate success. And it's a cycle. So the EMP cycle, it's really focused on the first stage is understand doing your homework with the literature, practitioners, um, and, and understanding the roles and responsibilities. So you're setting some initial goals and objectives for your environmental management plan. You're doing some research on the, the legal requirements that we need. You know, does the community have um, its own laws that we need to understand how to implement or policies for that matter? Then you move into the preparing for the EMP and that's where you're monitoring for like, what is the training we need? Who has the, who has the skills and the mindset that we can tap into this? What are some operational procedures? What have we done before that we need to include in this plan so that we can understand where we, where we started? Because what I think you'll find for most communities is that there's a lot of work in the environment going on. It's just no one's bringing it together to really look at it in a holistic, holistic way because you might find you don't have to actually do as much work as you think. And then it's working through the environmental management planning 
So that's where you're implementing the plan, you're monitoring for compliance, you're reporting on issues and you're identifying things that you need to correct. Um, and then you're updating and reviewing and you start all over again. Have the legal requirements changed? If you did your plan in 2018, you'd have to do this in 2019 because the legislation changed and you'd need to add in those new requirements through the impact assessment, for example. And so the considerations, our EMP should be grounded in sustainability and thinking it in terms of there are environmental considerations that we need to have, there are economic considerations, there's social and cultural uh, aspects, and there's also rights and interests. And so it's important that we, for a holistic approach, that we think about all of these as pieces of uh, pieces or pillars that can inform our environmental and guide our environmental management. So if we have specific rights that we want to highlight from the environment perspective, interestingly, I was on a talk with, or I, I heard a talk from Elder Albert Marshall, and he said something yesterday really that really resonated with me about the idea of instead of sacred rights, this idea of sacred responsibilities and detailing those out. And so that's where we can think about what are the interests of the communities and what are our rights um, that need to be protected as well. And so the process, it looks pretty complicated, but basically there's four phases, that planning phase, the developmental phase, the implementation and operational phase, and the monitoring and review phase. And generally at the beginning, chief and council need to take the lead on that. They need to follow along all the way along. They need to be kept informed, but it's generally your environmental team that is going to be doing most of the work here. And your job is to try and keep the community coming along with you and understanding where or how the plan is evolving. And then you repeat the whole thing again um, in a few years time as you've had a chance to start working with the plan, testing it and seeing what, really what works and what doesn't work. A key piece is due diligence. So when we're thinking about decision-making, um, about our lands and what projects might affect the environment, it's really important to have that due diligence piece that you're setting up uh, procedures and policies that are helping decision makers make an informed, consistent decision. That it's not just, you know, the council of the day can make those decisions. It's like, no, here are the procedures, here's what we've set out, here are the site plans, here's the environmental controls that we're looking for. It's also about looking at the past to say, what are the things we don't wanna make the same mistake again? What are we doing now that um, maybe we like or we don't like? And what are the implications for future use? You know, so if we're saying there's going to be no auto mechanic, there's gonna be no auto mechanics in our community. Well, what does that say to the two or three uh, people who are making their livelihoods doing that? How do you work with your communities to make those decisions? Lots of times when I do this training in person, everyone wants to talk about, well, how do we enforce this? How do we, and this is a really challenging uh, concept. It's not an easy one. And I honestly don't have any specific answers that say, if you do this and this, this is what's going to happen. But generally the answer to compliance is really about having people understand that this is a community driven process that that it wasn't just chief and council that made these arbitrary, arbitrary decisions, that we took the time that we felt we needed to talk to community members about why this is important, and that we came together as a community and decided that these are the principles of our environmental management that we wanna have. And so for somebody to come in at the end of that and say, whoa, 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 then you know, you never talked to me about that. It's about saying, you know, we created this opportunity, we, we created this plan, and it's a level playing field. Everybody has to play by the same rules now. Doesn't matter what happened in the past. Today, this is how we're starting to manage our environmental footprint. And yes, people are gonna be upset with it because change is always hard in our communities. Um, and we have to be communicate with our, with, our, uh, with our members about, you know, it's about not just the law. So it could be a First Nation, or it could be an indigenous law, an own community law. It could be regulations, it could be guidelines, standards, 
It could even be things like specific mitigation measures. Um, but generally, when we think about compliance um, off reserve, it's really focused on conditions of approval. Um, and there's also fines and things associated with those federal laws. So it's really important that you understand, um, you know, if a First Nation um, is, is, you know, um, impacts the land or water, that there could be fines that the First Nation may impact if it, uh, um, if it's applicable to one of those um, federal legislations. So the objective of, a, of compliance is to protect the rights and interests and ultimately the environment of the First Nation members and future generation. You're really focused on trying to get people to voluntarily comply. So you wanna make them as easy and transparent as possible. And generally that's through education and good communication. You have to do the community engagement, you have to do the education and you have to have people understand how all of this works together. Because the First Nation as a governance structure needs to comply with terms and conditions for land instruments and, and lands, um, other land uh, administration, legal and policy requirements. So bylaws and zoning in some cases, other environmental requirements and land use plans. They have to recognize that the decisions that they make have can have significant impacts. That's not to say that they need to debate them for a long time, but they have to use those tools, as I said, to help them make those consistent decision makers, deci sorry, to help them make consistent decisions. Um, and it's really the lands manager and the environmental team that has to support chief and council to make those decisions to say, you know, here are the considerations that we need to uh, consider and here's the information we need to collect. So failures for environmental compliance or management can result in costs through litigation and or fines and penalties. And they can damage the First Nation lands and, and resources. So through a contaminated site, for example, that there's no resources to clean up. It can damage the First Nation's reputation. And it could also result in the death or injury of a community member, depending on what it is. So when we think about um, monitoring, generally we're thinking about what what can we do to monitor the environment. So we've set a we've set a uh, a requirement that we have to do an environmental site assessment or something along those lines. It's really about assessing whether or not um, the things that we thought were going to be impact impacted by the proposed development actually happened, and so. The purpose of monitoring is really just to say, okay, we thought that um, there was going to be an impact to the environment. Uh, are we actually seeing that? Can we monitor that through time? And can we recognize those successes? So when, you know, a community developer says, you know, I want to put up a, a building or something or a gas station, they've, but we want to do it in the best environmental way, you say, okay, we're going to monitor, we're going to have some test wells. And when those come back negative or positive for you know having fuel leaking out or not, then you're celebrating the success of yes, we you know you've done it the right way, or we're able to pick up on those impacts early enough that we can that the cleanup isn't a million dollars; it's closer to a few thousand dollars for us to clean that, and we can correct it more quickly. So these are really about just keeping a finger on the pulse of what's happening in your communities. And that can be things like monitoring the effectiveness of, of um, septic beds. It could be a monitoring your effectiveness of your sewage treatment or even waste management for that matter. And so when we think about monitoring and compliance tools, there's quite a, you know, there's a, a different array of tools that you can use. The first would be an environmental site assessment. So this is an ESA, and generally that could be on a specific site. It could also be on the whole community. And so for communities that have moved into self-governance outside of the Indian Act, uh, ISC um, will generally want to do an ESA, an environmental site assessment for the whole community. And so what you're trying to do is trying to assess, and there's a few different phases to this, but the first phase is just 
are there sites in the community that we need to be aware of to guide future development? And it's also about liabilities. So in the case of a First Nation transitioning into the First Nation Lands Management Act or other self-government, ISC is really focused on what are the environmental liabilities that they're responsible for. And then once the community becomes self-governing in terms of lands and the environment, then it becomes, okay, now the decisions that you're making that impact the land and water, that will be now your responsibility and liability. And so that's really about that baseline. Um, they tend to be fairly technical and there's also quite a bit of liability within ESA. And so generally communities won't conduct these on their own. They'll actually hire uh, consultants who are trained to complete those and take on that liability to do those assessments for them. You could also have an emergency response plan. So this would be in situations, uh, for example, in my home community, there are three, I think now, uh, gas stations all along the only road in and out of Curve Lake. And so it might be helpful to have an emergency response plan if there was ever a fire or a major disaster in that area, how we're going to respond to that type of emergency. For other communities, it could be related to forest fires, for example, flooding um, or other aspects as well. And it could even include things like, how are we going to feed people nutritious food? This is definitely something that communities have talked about, uh, that something they hadn't considered in their emergency response plan until they actually implemented it. So there is a bit of learning in this as well. You could also use an environmental audit. So this would be, you know, a simple audit of a business or a particular site um, where you would do a quick audit of the environmental conditions in that land. In some cases, this doesn't have to be super technical. Um, it could be things like monitoring your lands for dumping and things like that. It could also be associated with, you know, how much paper are we using in our First Nation? Things of that nature. There's also the ISC, ISC environmental review process. This is a process by which ISC helps determine whether or not an environmental assessment uh, or an impact assessment is required for a particular development. And the best thing to do is to connect with ISC. They'll generally, it's generally a checklist for them, but they can share this with you as well on how that process works. And it can also give you good information on what are the types of development that we should be uh, highlighting in our environmental management plan as something we need to monitor a little bit more closely. What are the triggers for more monitoring? And then you might have, have other monitoring plans. So those could be simple like site plans. It could be um, site specific uh, management plans. It could even be things like contaminated site management plans. There's lots of different tools that you can use for compliance and monitoring. And so, as I said before, you know, monitor is really about recognizing success, uh, detecting issues early on, identifying your gaps in your EMP planning. So, you know, every policy is written and the test is really once people start to use it. Um, it also allows you to identify new environmental information um, and it can create records of ongoing activities. And so this is part of keeping chief and council um, in most cases, again, this is First Nation specific, but keeping decision makers aware through annual reporting on, you know, here's what we're, we're actually doing, here's what we think we need in terms of capacity for next year. Um, because what I think we'll, you'll see is that as you start to make this work, this plan, it becomes more and more, you start to build your knowledge. Some things become more efficient, but you also start to see more requests for your time in terms of doing these environmental monitoring and compliance tools. So trying to think about this on an annual basis helps you plan and budget for the future. And so, you know, the key takeaway is that everyone in the administration has to be involved in environmental management. You know, even, you know, even the finance department needs to be thinking about this because in some cases you might be collecting fees for garbage dumping and things like that. And they can be really helpful in terms of structuring easy to follow payment structures that are consistent with the First Nation reporting practices. Um, and it's also an opportunity for you to re 
connect with your community and emphasize that we're all stewards of the land, that we need to be, be mindful of our land, that we're connected, that we're part of that environment, and that they'll be able to see their views and insights shown through that environmental management plan. You know, so in 10 years down the road, when you're revisiting that plan, you're, you know, you're seeing that elder's knowledge, you're seeing those pers perspectives, and you're able to adapt those and, and change them through time as you as we grow and understand and and really practice good environmental management. And so, again, thank you so much for today. And in conclusion, environmental management uh, training it provides this introductory information and we have a framework for how you develop these emps so definitely reach out to nelma if you have any questions about the training or want to get access to it environmental management is a real critical piece of enabling community growth and sustainability it's it's right up there with land use planning zoning all of these pieces are combined and it's really important that our communities start thinking about this and putting together plans for how to manage it um, and it should work in conjunction with other land use and economic planning exercises because again remember those four pillars rights interests social and culture environment um, and the economy, they're all connected and they all need to be considered. So miigwech, and now I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Clay. We do have in the chat a previous question um, about the community garden. Oh, right, let me yeah. go back up. And a slaw nearby for watering. Stronium, I think that is a radioactive isotope. Yes. Yes, it was um, tested in the slough mm -hmm. and we had been using it for uh, spraying our vegetables in the garden. Um, we're not all savvy on uh, using the slew water so I'm just kind of wondering if there might be a way of um, having some kind of a filter system so that we can use it. That's a really good question. I don't have a specific answer about strontium uh, although I think it is really hard for radio radio like to I don't know that we can actually filter radioactive isotopes out of water. Although I could be wrong, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure, but I would suspect. So, if you remember Fukushima? They're actually having to release some radioactive water into the ocean. They don't have any other choice, um, and I think they're filtering it. But I'm not exact. I don't know what they're filtering out of it either. So I'd have to get back to you on that answer. But you really highlight an important uh, and an, a really important um, point about. Um, protecting source water, right? Your your water, there is opportunities to clean water, uh, but the more contaminated your water, the the more expensive it is to to treat. So I would assume that to treat strontium in in a water source, that it would be particularly expensive in a, if it even exists. Um, and so having source water protection plans is really key as well. So thinking about where our communities are drawing drinking water in particular, but also, as you mentioned, like watering food, like we see that with E. coli recalls on, on romaine lettuce all the time about, you know, the things that we are in water that we're putting on plants can impact our, our health as well. So the cleaner you can keep your water at the source, the better it is to use. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if there's no other questions, that's wonderful, Clay. That certainly gives us a good understanding of, you know, um, the roles and responsibilities and, you know, um, greater environment management um, so with that, thank you ever so much, Shimi for 
for your presentation. Um, you're able to uh, now uh, your next steps would be to uh, have your health break and uh, return to the next uh, workshop sessions at 10 45 so you've got a 10 to 10 15 to 10 45 is your uh network break and uh, we'll see you all again at another point in time miigwech clay and thank everyone for joining in in our session miigwech bye, bye oh bye bye